Okay, good morning everybody in the Americas and good evening for those in Asia. Um, hello seems more relevant in these times as we never know what times the others are on the other side of Zoom. Um, anyhow, I know that uh, we have quite a few joining us from different parts of the world as well today. Uh, so thank you so much and welcome or welcome back to Emory Climate Talks. My name is Eri Saikawa and I'm an Associate Professor of Environmental Sciences at Emory University. This webinar series is made possible by our anonymous donor that supports our trip to the United Nations climate change negotiations. And Emory Climate Talks is in partnership with the Department of Environmental Sciences and the Resilience and Sustainability Collaboratory at Emory University. Just last week, uh, one of the Emory alums from the climate change negotiation trip uh, told me that Hurricane Katrina landing in New Orleans was 15 years ago. That was two years after our, I arrived in the US and it still felt like yesterday. And before the actual 15th anniversary, Hurricane Laura just hit Louisiana this morning, the same region where Hurricane Rita hit the same year. This month, um, I've heard that Asia has been hit very badly with the floods as well. Um, we have been so busy with COVID and there were not many co uh, coverages from outside of the US in the major American newspapers, I feel. But I'm so excited to have Dr. Aruna Bagosh today, the CEO and founder of the Council on Energy, Environment and Water, come speak to us today. Scientists say that the natural disasters are increasing its severity due to climate change and the most vulnerable are often hit the hardest. Um, before I introduce our speaker today, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some logistics um, and thank you all for your support. Uh, I, I think you've been sick of me asking you to subscribe to the YouTube channel, but thank you to you. We now have 110 subscribers and have a special link for our channel. And I would also like to thank Leah Thomas for doing all the work behind the scenes, creating the YouTube channel, creating flyers, etc. So please do check out our website, the YouTube channel, and subscribe if you haven't. As you have noticed, we are recording today's talk as usual, and we will make that available to you in the next couple of days on the channel. For the recording purposes, we have muted your microphone, but if you have any questions during the talk or after the talk, um, please feel free to use the chat function to type up the questions so that we can raise them during the Q&A session. So today we're so fortunate to have Dr. Arunaba Ghosh with us. Dr. Ghosh is a public policy professional, advisor, author, columnist, and institution builder. Um, as the founder CEO of the Council on Energy, Environment, and Water since 2010, he has led CW to the top ranks as one of Asia's leading policy research institutions for seven years in a row and it is among the world's 20 best climate think tanks in 2013 and 2016. He has been actively involved in the design of the International Solar Alliance since inception. Uh, he conceptualized and is a founding board member of the Clean Energy Access Network, CLEAN. With experience in 45 countries, he previously worked at Princeton, Oxford, UNDP in New York, and WTO in Geneva. In 2018, the UN Secretary General nominated him to the UN's Committee for Development Policy. In 2020, the government of India appointed him co-chair of the Energy, Environment and Climate Change track for India's forthcoming science, technology and innovation policy. His 2019 TED Talk uh, on air quality, Mission 808080, crossed 100,000 views within three weeks of release. I highly recommend, this is a very great talk. He is one of six members of an international high-level panel of the Environment of Peace Initiative. He is also lead author of Jobs, Growth and Sustainability, a new social contract for India's recovery. And he is the co-author editor of four books. Dr. Ghosh's essay, Rethink India's Energy Strategy in Nature was selected as one of 2015's 10 most influential essays. Dr. Ghosh also advises government, industry, civil society, and inter international organizations around the world. This has included India's prime minister's office, several ministries, and state governments, and he was invited by France uh, to advise on the COP21 climate negotiations and also advised extensively on HFC, hydrofluorocarbon negotiations as well. 
Um, he served on the executive committee of the India-US Pace Setter Fund. He has been a member of Track 2 Dialogues with 10 countries, regions, and formulated the Mahastra Guangdong Partnership on Sustainability. He is a member of the Environment Pollution Authority for the National Capital Region. So as you can see, I can go forever um, with his great work that he's done, but I'll just finish that he holds a DPhil from Oxford and topped economics from St. Stephen's College, Delhi. I actually met Dr. Gosh when I was a student at Princeton and he was a postdoctoral fellow then. And I thought he was such a charismatic leader already. And I still remember the time when we talked right before he was uh, done with the fellowship. And I was very, um, that this was a memory that I have that I really admired what he was doing. And I felt a lot of bonding um, because we were quite a few folks from Asia at that time. And he had a vision and also listening to his TED talk, um, I feel that he's still the same. Like he has such a clear vision and I'm so excited to have Dr. Gosh joining us to tell him his vision for in this very difficult times. So it is great to see you virtually, Arunaba, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Eri. Um, thank you to all of you who've joined. Um, good day, as the Australians say, it's good day to all of you, uh, even though it's evening for me. Uh, Eri, thank you for that very kind introduction and uh, walk back memory lane 10 years ago. Uh, in fact, CEW uh, was founded uh, just over 10 years ago in, uh, on the 11th of August, 2010. And just prior to that, as Eri was saying, I was uh, working at Princeton and I used to really enjoy my conversations with Eri. Um, and uh, what, in, in some ways, uh, you know, a lot has happened uh, in terms of the advances we've made uh, as a planet, but particularly in Asia, in things like renewable energy and concerns about air quality and things like that. But in many other ways, maybe we've regressed and uh, we are in a situation where we are wondering whether international cooperation and international action on many of the issues that matter to us is receding. Um, I think we've got to keep the long view in mind and there are always going to be crests and troughs in the way we approach things. And as long as we have a clear direction of travel, it should give us hope. Um, so in my talk today, I wanted to articulate uh, some elements of that direction of travel. And I'm going to share my screen now, but uh, we were just uh, discussing offline. Uh, if you have any questions, please indicate that to Eri and she will be uh, kind or rude enough to interrupt me, and I will most certainly try and answer to the best of my ability. And of course, there will be time at the end of the talk as well to, to take on your questions as much as I can. So once again, thank you for having me, and let me now go ahead and share my screen. So I've titled my, uh, my talk today as Risks, Resilience, and Rejuvenation. Um, what's the case for shifting sustainability from the margin to the mainstream? I say this um, six months into a, uh, or rather eight months into a pandemic that has completely enveloped the world. And it's a, it's a level of social experimentation that we've not seen, at least in our own lifetimes of how does the world respond to a planetary level shock? Uh, but guess what? Climate change is going to bring a series of planetary level shocks against which we probably might have some technological responses, but we've certainly not tested our social and political responses, um, which, uh, which is being tested right now in 2020. And we won't be able to be, uh, we won't be able to deal with these risks. We won't be able to make ourselves and our governance systems more resilient. And we certainly will not be able to rejuvenate our very depressed economies unless we take a very strategic call to shift sustainability from conversations within echo chambers or from the margin and into the mainstream. Let me just introduce for a second uh, my organization. As Eri mentioned 10 years ago, I founded the Council on Energy, Environment, and Water. We have been ranked amongst 
Asia's leading policy research institutions and amongst the 20 best climate think tanks in the world. But our work extends uh, across a range of areas. We look at the here and now issues of energy access for millions of households in India and elsewhere. Uh, we look at the energy transition and have been quite instrumental in driving a lot of India's renewable energy policies. But we also look at the legacy issues of uh, a fossil-based power sector that we are saddled with and that many other emerging economies also are saddled with. But we also look into the future where we think about ways to drive energy, uh, industrial sustainability, plot out low carbon pathways through our modeling work, as well as give particular attention to risks and adaptation. And we also facilitate technology collaborations between India and other countries. Um, Last year, we set up a dedicated center for energy finance at CEW to help design the financial instruments that would facilitate the flow of billions of dollars into the energy transition in India and in other emerging economies. In short, at CEW, we use data, integrated analysis, and strategic outreach to explain and change the, re the use, reuse, and misuse of resources. But 10 years on, the bit I'm most excited about CW is our nearly 100 member team. And we believe in what we call leadership by initiative. Despite being nearly 100 members, we have a median age, which still remains under 30. Um, and that's because we believe that um, policy think tanks, policy institutions should represent the demography that um, emerging economies do have, which is very young populations, strong aspirations for their own lives and livelihoods, but who in the course of their own lifetimes are gonna be faced with those very nonlinear risks that I was referring to earlier. So let's start with the first component uh, about risk. We of course know that we've been doing a lot of things to the planet. The big question is, what will the planet do to us? If this were a more interactive session, I if I were there in person with you, I would have asked you a quiz question of where this photograph might have been taken from, but I'll give you the answer. This photograph is from the airfield in the city of Chennai in South India uh, from 2015. This was November 2015, just a few weeks before the Paris climate negotiations began, and Chennai that month got hit by a once in a 100 year flooding event. Uh, in the subsequent years, the neighboring state of Kerala got hit by a once in a 100 year flooding event. In 2015, I published a global assessment of climate risks along with Sir David King in the UK, Joe Dadi in, in China, and Dan Schrag at Harvard. And we talked about these nonlinear risks of extreme weather events. And we intentionally published that report and released it in the Bombay and the London stock exchanges to get the financial communities of some of the leading economies to think about what this would mean in terms of stranded assets or for their investments. But five years on, we've not really made much progress. You've probably seen these charts if you work on climate change, but let me just repeat. In the last 800,000 years, we've not seen the kind of uh, concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere uh, ever before. The Keeling curve, of course, shows you that uh, uh, while, temperature, uh, while the, the concentrations keep rising, the temperatures also keep rising with a lag. And we already are one degree above the pre-industrial era of temperatures, global average temperatures. And we also have seen mean sea levels having risen by about three and a half, 3.7 inches in the last 25 years, eight inches alone uh, since uh, in, in the last 140 years or so. But the point I wanted to make is that we have to look beyond these overall assessments. We have to think about inequality in how climate change begins to affect us. Think about a city, a coastline, um, uh, a city by the coastline, well-developed as that upper picture shows. And imagine an extreme weather event hitting those buildings. And, uh, excuse me, sorry. 
And then imagine um, somewhere near that city, a fishing community. Um, and that gets hit by an extreme weather event. Now, the event is the same. The manner in which it affects community is very different. One could argue that the loss of lives might be much higher in the fishing community, which is poorer, doesn't have the requisite um, shelters, et cetera, to protect them. But one could also argue that the economic cost is gonna be higher for the city, which is, which is more hard infrastructure invested there. So what should we care about, lives or livelihoods? And those are political questions. Those are not just questions of scientific assessment. If that were sounding just like a scenario to you, let me give you some real examples. The upper panel uh, is from Cyclone Amphan, which hit the Bay of Bengal uh, earlier this year in May. It was the strongest super cyclone um, in several decades. And the only super cyclone of that scale that hit the state of West Bengal um, for the third time since 1582. So for nearly 500, 450 years, you've had that scale of an event only two other times before. The other panel is Cyclone Nisarg, which occurred just two weeks after in the Arabian Sea. The Arabian Sea doesn't see that many cyclones actually, but it was the strongest such storm that hit the state of Maharashtra uh, since 1891. But the reason I point this out is that there was a lot of concern, is this gonna go and hit the capital of Maharashtra, Mumbai? And of course the citizens of Mumbai, the financial capital of India were very worried. I have many friends there, they were hunkered down. As it happened, landfall happened about 96 kilometers to the south, near fishing communities. So how we think about monitor, trace, and then respond to extreme events will matter a lot depending on who we care about. India alone has experienced about nearly 500 extreme weather events since 1972, most of which have occurred since 2005. And according to analysis that my colleagues are doing, the frequency of these cyclones is jumping from about, uh, about three per year in the 1980s to nearly six per year in the 2010s. But why these risks, while these risks have an unequal kind of impact, um, there's also big inequality in the way we deal with the, the carbon budget that remains. Between now and 2030 alone, China, the US, Japan, and the European Union will consume nearly 49% of the global carbon space that's available, uh, leaving very little for the rest of the developing world. While we, under the Paris Agreement, have all agreed that we need to try and keep temperature rise to well below two degrees, maybe even try and approach 1.5. The problem is that the climate skeptics are also often the climate culprits. This survey was done by the Financial Times late last year, which found that respondents in the United States were the most climate skeptic in the world. About 15% of the respondents thinking that it's, uh, that humans are not responsible or the climate is not changing. Whereas the poorer countries or those that are most extreme to extreme, uh, exposed to extreme weather also tend to be the most concerned about the impacts of climate change. So that's the inequality of how we are dealing with uh, our emissions and the inequality in how we might get impacted. So that brings me to the second part of this talk. Why do we then care about resilience? Resilience can mean many things. And as the pandemic suggests, it starts with the individual, right? Um, we've all been locked down, some for many months, some maybe for a few weeks. But resilience, we often also think about, about governance. You know, will our governments be resilient enough to help us when planetary shocks hit. Somewhere between the individual and the and kind of formal governance are communities. Now, what is a community? Is it the condominium in which I live? Or is it the town in which I live? Or is it the broader national capital region to which I belong? Um, 
we need to build resilience across many layers of governance. Let me just, again, give some um, numbers just to illustrate why this becomes important. In India, we, um, the, the government published its first official climate change assessment, even though institutions like ours have been doing that for some time. Uh, and the numbers are pretty grim. Average temperature has already increased over the course of the last century by about 0.7 degrees Celsius. And if emissions continued on a, on a high trajectory, we could be looking at 4.4 degrees increase in, in the, uh, in, in, in relative to the last uh, 40 years over the course of the century. Heat waves will become three or four times more frequent. Um, the, 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 natural the, the climate related disasters that I was referring to has already caused about $80 billion of damage. Uh, India belongs to the region which is called the third pole of the world outside of the North and the South Pole, the highest concentration of frozen water anywhere else on the planet. It's the source of 10 major rivers on which depend um, many countries, um, China, India. And in that region alone, the temperature rise is likely to be even more, over five degrees by 2100 in the worst case scenario. And our estimation suggests that uh, between, in the latter half of the century, India alone could be suffering crop losses anywhere between one and a half to to more than two and a half trillion dollars in 2015 prices. So what do we need to build resilience against such nonlinear risks? We need to act at the national level and we need to act at the international level. At the national level, we need, and we've proposed this, what we call an environment and health de-risking mission. And let me just go through some of those steps. We need a what we call a climate risk atlas to map out the critical vulnerabilities. Now, you live in a developed country. Uh, if you were living in Florida, for instance, insurance companies would have a fairly good idea or of the kind of extreme weather events that are likely to face. And your insurance coverage or the premiums would be reflecting those risks. That's not the case with developing countries. No developing country has a detailed, high resolution climate risk atlas. So at CEW, we started, we started developing one. In a month or two from now, we'll release our first disaster um, uh, uh, mapping. And then hopefully a year from now, we'll be able to give you a high resolution climate risk atlas. But developing countries across the world would need this to form the knowledge base on which you can do other things. Big cities in emerging economies, which have big populations, need city action plans. Um, in India, we've estimated that Delhi, Ahmedabad, Bangalore, Mumbai, Kolkata, five major cities are likely to experience the highest levels of heat-related mortality in this century. Then we need climate resilient infrastructure. And we can talk about this in more detail, what climate resilient infrastructure would entail. But the point is, of course, they're more expensive than just putting cement into a bridge. But the cost of doing nothing is significantly higher, often twice as much as the expense in building climate resilient infrastructure. We've also recommended a nationwide integrated emergency surveillance system. Now, what India has done in the last two decades is preventing loss of lives. Um, a major cyclone that hit in 1999 cost nearly 10,000 lives at that time. A similar sized cyclone that hit the same state last year um, resulted in uh, about 60 odd lives that were lost. And that was because of very good advance warning. But we need to get better than that, not just saving lives. We need to help communities and businesses get back in business. Um, and that's why you need a more real-time emergency surveillance system that brings in citizens, authorities, et cetera, in, in, in the loop. And finally, you need a unified emergency response framework. Something similar to what Japan did after the Fukushima nuclear accident, where standardized emergency protocols were developed and and conveyed to residential areas. How do citizens behave in an emergency? Will help emergency responders uh, get, get through the, the challenges better. But that's at the national or at the community level. We also need to do something at the international level. Now, before I explain what I mean, let me give you a fact. During the course of this pandemic, all least developed countries 
are likely to get about $132 million from the World Bank from what are called pandemic insurance bonds, pandemic bonds. Wimbledon, which unfortunately couldn't host the championships, but started investing in pandemic insurance nearly two decades ago, is going to get a payout of $141 million alone. That is the injustice and the inequity that we face in the world. That billions of people, not millions, billions of people in the world do not have any kind of real insurance cover against planetary level shocks. So in a, in, in, in to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, um, I wrote a, a document calling for a global risk pooling reserve fund. And the way it would work is that we would pool different countries located differently, have different types of climate risk. Somewhere it could be heat stress, somewhere it could be a flooding event, somewhere it could be drought, somewhere it could be um, a, 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 a vector borne diseases. So by pooling in different types of risks, you can actually reduce the peaks of the risk curve. Along with that, the proposal is that this fund would allocate a portion of what the International Monetary Fund has called special drawing rights. And they would draw on these, this kind of special currency when disasters above a certain threshold strike. What's even more interesting about the way I propose this is that this fund would only take a, the first hit, but transfer the bulk of the subscribed risk to existing market insurance mechanisms, which currently don't look at developing countries. So in a way, you are bridging the insurers, the biggest insurers in the world, with the poorest communities or the most vulnerable communities. And some of this risk could be passed through to multilateral development banks, and some of it could be passed through uh, even the lower risk profile could even help reduce the cost of finance for more sustainable infrastructure. So I've been speaking for about 18, 19 minutes now, and I want to now come into the final part of my presentation. So we've talked about why we need to pay attention to risks and the inequalities embedded there. We've talked about the national and the global response that is needed to become more resilient against planetary shocks. But look, let's get real. We are worried about the job losses in the tens of millions, perhaps the hundreds of millions, thanks to the pandemic. Countries are gonna be focusing a lot about how to drive growth, perhaps at any cost. And people like us are gonna be worried about, can that be sustainable? Is that an impossible trinity? Will public policy deliver on two rather than three? Is it even possible to deliver on all three? And our argument is that it is possible. Two months ago at CW, we released, we were the first institution in the country that released an economy-wide roadmap to come out of the pandemic, uh, which would deliver on all three points of this triangle, jobs, growth, and sustainability. And I wanna walk you through some of those ideas, but also illustrate where international cooperation is needed. Let me start with rural areas because that gets forgotten most of the time. This lady, I took this photograph in southern India last year. She has a, a, a plot of land, which is one acre. It's tiny. It's what we would call a marginal farmer. And she's growing on that one acre plot more than 15 different crop varieties using a new kind of farming called natural farming or agroforestry, where you don't use any kind of chemical fertilizers or pesticides. We use natural inoculants to treat the soil um, and, and increase soil microbial uh, creation, uh, increased aeration in the soil, more carbon retention in the soil while you're increasing yields. Uh, Andhra Pradesh, the state where I took this photograph, has the world's largest such program already underway. 650,000 farmers already engaged in natural farming. It's called ZBNF, ZBNF for you Americans. Uh, zero budget natural farming because the cost of these chemical inputs comes down. And we evaluated uh, this and you can see where farmers have, uh, have, have uh, used their natural inputs, how the costs for, for uh, their cultivation drops significantly uh, compared to if you were using chemical inputs. And we believe this could be one of the ways in which 
the distress in the agricultural economy could be, could be addressed while keeping it sustainable. Another aspect, now India uh, relies a lot on groundwater. In fact, it uses more groundwater to drive its agriculture than, uh, than China and the United States put together. But India also has the largest number of solar-based irrigation pump sets deployed anywhere in the world. Uh, more than 200,000 such pumps have been de deployed. The plan is to get to about 2.7 million pumps, uh, which could get up to about um, 20, 30 gigawatts of solar power alone. So what we did at CW is we mapped out every single district in the country on 20 different parameters from groundwater level, cropping pattern, access to credit for farmers, access to um, rural markets and so forth to define where you would get the maximum return on investment for a technology like this. And the darker blue areas are those districts. Now this kind of a tool, and we have a dynamic tool um, called at portal.cw.in where you can go and experiment with this and decide where you want to deploy this kind of a technology. Beyond that, rural areas also need a lot of um, uh, energy access. Now, in the last uh, five years, and certainly over the last decade, India has made significant moves in giving access to electricity as well as access to clean cooking energy to millions of households. 118 million people have moved out of absolute electricity poverty only in the last three years. 350 million. Just imagine 350 million. That's nearly the entire population in the United States have gotten access to electricity in the last decade. Um, similarly, with cooking energy, uh, we have 160 million who have gained access to clean cooking energy in just the last three years, 700 million in the last decade. Uh, CW conducts the world's largest multi dimensional survey on energy access, and that's why you've got the 2015 2018 numbers. And now we've increase the scale of that survey and we'll be releasing the results for that in, in, a, in a couple of months. But what we say from a rejuvenation point of view is that energy access now matters not just for the household, but for income generating activities in rural economy. We did an extensive study um, looking at these technologies that exist those pictures show you a solar powered loom in Gujarat, a solar powered charkha, another type of a loom, sewing machine, energy efficient mill to treat lentils, a flour mill driven by solar energy, energy efficient sugar cane juicer, solar powered milking machine, a refrigerator. And we estimate that there is more than a $50 billion opportunity for scaling up these technologies in rural India. So yesterday, as it happens, sorry, I just skipped ahead. We initiated at CW uh, a $3 million program in which we will be investing in six such startups, uh, giving them the financial and the technical inputs to help them scale from selling hundreds of their products to thousands to tens of thousands of their products. And this program yesterday, we call it Powering Livelihoods, it was launched yesterday by, by two cabinet members of the Indian government and, and uh, Her Excellency Tamilola Ogunbei, uh, who's the uh, CEO for Sustainable Energy for All and the UN Secretary General's Special Representative for Sustainable Energy for All. So that's on the rural side. Let me quickly, in the last five or six minutes, talk to you a little bit about other aspects of how we can make ourselves more efficient. Now, as I was mentioning right at the outset, we deal with the legacy issues of our power sector. This graphic shows you that our thermal power capacity, which is sizable, and India is the third largest electricity producer in the world, uh, you see that the plants that are newer, uh, zero to five years, 23% of the capacity, but only 17% of the, of, of the generation share. Uh, all the plants that are uh, five to 10 years, and if you combine that, you see that overall these newer plants are not going, getting used as much. This is another way to think about that. You see that the bulk of the capacity is in the more recent plants. But 
their plant load factor is lower than the much older plants, which are 15 to 20 years, 30 to 35 years. Now, here's the problem. This is the legacy political economy of our power sector, where the way the power purchase agreements are signed is that we are still, many of the electricity utilities are still buying electricity from the older inefficient plants, which are costlier. Whereas we could be reducing emissions from more efficient plants if we switch to these plants. And we have to deal with that. Uh, and our estimation is that to retrofit all of these old plants, it would cost us about $2 billion to retrofit them with pollution abatement equipment. Shutting them down, um, shutting down 25 year old and older power plants and focusing on the more efficient thermal power capacity would actually gain about two and a half billion dollars. So when we are thinking about re rejuvenation of the economy, you've got to think about how do we solve for the for for the legacy issues of the power sector. This will also depend on how we create a democratic demand for clean air. And Eri mentioned the TED talk I delivered last year. Now it's crossed two hundred thousand views. And my colleague, we've started a new podcast uh, series at CW called Peak Planet. Uh, it's it's it, it's now hosted on the largest podcast network in the country. And we're trying to create this bottom-up citizen-led demand for cleaner air, which would then solve for the way we deal with our power sector, with industrial emissions and so forth. But having said that, India is also making a lot of progress on renewables. Those graphics show you that we now have the third largest renewable energy capacity in the world. And 29% of our electricity generated from renewable sources and large hydro. We actually don't include large hydro in renewables as many other countries do. So that is significant. And let me just go down memory lane a little bit. When I started up CW, India had less than 20 megawatts of, renew of solar capacity. And we now have a more than 35,000 megawatts of solar capacity. In 2014, the Prime Minister's office asked us, how big can we get on renewables? And a few months later, after our analysis, we brought out the, India brought out the target of 175,000 megawatts by 2022. Last year, the Prime Minister announced we are looking for 450,000 megawatts by 2030. Now, here's the problem. Um, it presents a huge investment opportunity $200 billion investment opportunity. Uh, we will need uh, $160 billion just of debt capital by 2030. But focus on this graphic, and I'm just rushing through the slides a little bit to, to be conscious of the time. Look at China, look at Brazil, look at India. Asset financing for clean, clean energy projects is primarily domestic. Look at the United States, look at the UK, look at Italy. Most of asset financing for clean energy projects is foreign. In short, money is not flowing where the sun shines the most. 15% of the world's population got 40% of the world's energy investment. Whereas 40% of the world's population got 15% of the world's energy investment. Emerging economies are where the action is going to be in terms of the energy transition. And if you can't find a way to lower that cost of finance, as those two graphics show you, the cost of finance is the largest component in our solar tariffs, even though our solar tariffs are already some of the lowest in the world. So we've been looking at emerging economies, India, South Africa, Indonesia. We just released a report on Sri Lanka. We'll be soon looking at Indonesia and there is a mismatch between perceived and real risks that investors think about. They think there's a risk of foreign exchange, they think there's a risk of curtailment of the renewable energy power, etc. So we need to solve for it. So that's why I said we set up the Center for Energy Finance last year at CEW, which reduces the information asymmetry. We have information every single state in India we have information on all emerging economies, and soon we'll be launching a portal for the Central Electricity Authority that will give you real-time data on renewable energy generation across the country for every single renewable energy plant. When you get that kind of information, you're able to reduce your information barriers. 
We've also developed along with two other institutions in France and, and the Netherlands, a design of a common risk mitigation mechanism where, again, the risks across renewable energy projects across countries could be pooled and you could reduce the risk premiums that are needed to insure against uh, those projects. We've been developing, I can get into the details of this uh, in the Q&A. We've developed new business models for utilities to have rooftop solar uh, uh, systems. And these have been now approved by the Delhi Electricity Regulator. Our design has now been being adopted by other states. We are now piloting these projects out. In big cities, mobility is a big issue. That photograph at the bottom is the photograph I took in 2007. That's a, uh, it's an Indian electric vehicle that was parked in London. India was exporting electric vehicles then, but somehow did not invest enough, hard enough, while China raced ahead and became an EV behemoth in the course of the last decade. Meanwhile, now India is thinking seriously about EVs. So we already have a stock of about half a million electric vehicles, sales last year about 166,000, um, with unregistered vehicles, that's about 250,000. But the aim is to get to maybe about 23 million, 24 million electric vehicles by 2030. And of course, the, the, you know, India would save significantly on import bill of, 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 of oil and so forth. Um, but to really drive that transition, what we've been arguing is that there has to be a high level of indigenization of the powertrain and the battery pack um, for these electric vehicles, which could actually give the automobile sector in India uh, more industrial value add than would have been the case by just manufacturing ICE vehicles. So let me just spend a couple more minutes and close off. I've talked about the rural economy, I've talked about the renewables transition, the power sector legacy issues, the, 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 the mobility transition. The hard to abate sector is still iron and steel, cement, fertilizers, um, petrochemicals. Now, can green industrialization become a growth mantra? That graphic, uh, that schematic diagram shows you how green hydrogen could be used to manufacture iron and steel. Today, the costs are significantly higher than what would be the case of using blast furnace operations for manufacturing steel. But that report I released uh, last year for the UN Secretary General's Climate Summit, we showcase how in different sectors of India's economy, we can think about green hydrogen as the base fuel if we start investing in that technology now and potentially even create two million jobs just in the hydrogen supply chain. Now, no country in the world has so far tracked that green hydrogen now. So while India has, is no longer a climate naysayer, I would argue it's a climate leader. I wrote the first concept note for the International Solar Alliance, which was announced at the Paris Climate Summit. We've been involved with the HFC, um, uh, deal in, in the Montreal Protocol. Last year, India hosted the desertification conference of the parties where it promised 26 million hectares would be reclaimed and re, uh, for, for rejuvenation of the land. And more recently, India has announced a, a multi-country coalition for disaster resilient infrastructure. But on the technology side, the world is still far behind. A few years ago, I evaluated about 30 different climate tech partnerships across the world. And most of them focus on knowledge sharing, basically organizing conferences, very little technology transfer, almost no uh, R&D, a uh, joint R&D that goes on. So my proposal is this, if we wanna get serious about bending the emissions curve, we gotta think about industry. If we think seriously about industry, we gotta think about green hydrogen. That photograph is also from Fukushima, where now there is a 10 megawatt green hydrogen, solar-based hydrogen manufacturing facility. I propose that we can have an international global green hydrogen alliance, where emerging economies can become the test beds. There'll be joint tech development 
unlike mission innovation, which only focuses on individual countries acting on their own, funding could be pooled in in cash and kind. And of course, we would uh, be able to assess the risks of inaction against climate change versus insufficient action or inaction on developing new technologies. Let me simply conclude by saying that this case for shifting sustainability from the margin to the mainstream is not ideological alone, even though it has strong ethical moorings. The case rests on the future of humankind. The pandemic tells us that sustainability is both an imperative and a choice. Either we choose that path or the planet will force us to. One route is more expense, is expensive, being climate resilient, but not being climate resilient is certainly exorbitant. The environment is existence, sustainability is sustenance. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Arunaba. Um, on behalf of everybody, I would like to um, give a round of applause. I'm getting so many questions, so I'm just going to dive into the questions if that's okay. So the first question asks, um, what makes India so vulnerable? What is an example of climate resilient infrastructure? Right. So what makes India vulnerable is both natural factors as well as kind of uh, uh, man-made factors. Uh, the natural factors are that uh, India is already, large parts of India are arid or semi-arid. So while India has a lot of biodiversity and, 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 and many different climatic zones. Um, Central India is, has very low water tables. Um, we have um, a large part of the population, agricultural population, which is rain fed um, or dependent on just rains. And therefore, even small variations in climatic, uh, in climatic conditions has a very high impact in terms of what it would mean for lives and livelihoods. And that's where the resilience of communities comes in. What is an example of a resilient infrastructure? Uh, let's take a, um, a natural example. I showed you that, folk, that example of the cyclone Amphan that hit the Bay of Bengal, um, the, the only third such cyclone of that scale since 1582. Now, the Bay of Bengal, I mean, the, the West Bengal state and Bangladesh share this delta called the Sundarbans. It's the world's largest mangrove um, concentration. Mangroves are an example of natural climate resilient infrastructure. Um, but in building our cities, we are often getting rid of them. So London, let me give you a different example of climate resilient infrastructure, built the Thames Barrier. Uh, the Thames barrier uh, costs billions of pounds, but it has prevented even more billions of pounds of damage uh, from rising water levels when storm surges occur. Climate resilient infrastructure has to be, in my opinion, modular, where you don't always have the resources to build the, the seawalls that would be re relevant for 2100. But if it is modularly designed, then you can keep building as the risks increase. But for that, you need that detailed climate risk assessment, the climate risk atlas that I was referring to. Great, okay, moving on to the next one. What words of advice would you have for Emory students hoping to engage with similar sustainability efforts in the US, especially on the community and school levels? So I think, uh, you know, I, I mentioned earlier when I talked about resilience that uh, it stretches from the individual to the community, to the state. And I think what the pandemic has demonstrated is that community action matters a lot, both in terms of saving lives, as well as in terms of rejuvenating local economies, because if you're only waiting for the federal government or the state government to come and help you out, it's probably going to take a while. Now, how does that translate to what students could be doing? If you break down the problems that I just outlined, suppose you come from Louisiana, but you're studying in Emory University, um, and you want to think about what do I do for my local 
community. See if you have, if you can deploy your technical skills to develop localized climate risk assessments. Now the insurance coverage that I was talking about, Florida does not exist in Louisiana. Not to that extent. That's the inequality within your country as well. So can depressed communities get a better understanding of the climate risk they are going to face? You can apply your technical skills to that. In response, are there nature-based resilient solutions that can be deployed? I remember 2005 when Katrina hit. Um, I was living in the United States at the time in New York. And I remember how the levees broke. Now, so how do we, instead of just having cement levees, what kind of natural infrastructure can we build in for resilience? Similarly, on the rejuvenation side, what kind of local employment can you generate? Let me just give you one example, at least from India. Rooftop solar creates seven times more jobs per megawatt than utility scale solar. And utility scale solar creates far more jobs than thermal based power. CEW does the job census for renewables for green for green, green jobs in India. Our, our numbers get reported in parliament and by the International Renewable Energy Agency. So we've done this year on year. Now, if decentralized renewables is creating more jobs and we're looking for more jobs in our, in, in whether it's in the US or in India or elsewhere, then can you develop, as my colleagues have done, who are also in their mid 20s, the late 20s, develop new business models for utilities to create new business lines for, for uh, distributed renewables. It'll bring in local investment for the communities, it'll create local jobs, and it'll still keep utilities in business. That's exactly what we need in the Southeast uh, US actually, especially in Georgia too. Uh, so thanks for that. Um, another question is, is there a large presence of NGOs in India dedicated to promoting sustainability in their communities, such as having programs that financially incentivize farmers to use sustainable farming practices? That's a great question. So first, let me say, India has the largest number of NGOs in the world. It has more than 3 million NGOs. Uh, of course, you know, some could be one person shops. Um, but uh, focus specifically on sustainability is, is a very interesting question. Let me go back to that example of natural farming that I gave from Andhra Pradesh, which is a state in South India. Now, Andhra Pradesh is also where um, microfinance uh, kind of had a huge revolution about two decades ago. And microfinance, as you probably know across the world, is often women-led. It's women-led self-help groups that are formed in villages and communities that then lend to each other and create the ability to deploy that money towards more productive activities. It is that base of tens of thousands of women-led self-help groups that were established in Andhra Pradesh in the 2000s that allowed the state government to use that same base of NGOs um, in the, from 2015 onwards to roll out natural farming. In fact, the state government created another NGO um, with whom we work very closely that could kind of bring these self-help groups together and the self groups start training. So they created master trainers on natural farming in every district, then every block, then in every village. And those are training. I have been there many times. And uh, it's one, of, one very interesting anecdote I want to share with you. At one point we had in India, the, the village councils are called panchayats. And every, pan, every panchayat has a tiny room somewhere in the village where the councils meet. So these um, women-led self help groups wanted to make a presentation um, you know, uh, these are farmers. These are often not very educated women, but they were using a laptop and projecting on a, on a wall in the panchayat about their plans for rolling out. And another corner of the room were the men, their husbands, and they didn't have a PowerPoint presentation. They had presentations on paper. Uh, but the funny thing was that they in competition with the women had created men-led self-help groups. 
But the point is, you know, these jokes aside, that this on-ground um, basis of civil society organizations are needed to marry with uh, civil society organizations that are like us, which are more analytical. And that's why we launched Powering Livelihoods yesterday, the $3 million program to help these rural startups invest and scale up and create more, many more micro entrepreneurs. Yeah, I love the initiatives that you're doing. And I think the next question goes very well. What have been some of the greatest obstacles that CEW has faced and how do you approach these challenges? Um, the number one obstacle, and it sounds a little glib, is belief, to be honest. And um, when, when I last met Eri, you know, uh, in Princeton uh, 10 years ago, I didn't know whether I was you know, making a foolhardy decision as I'd been out of the country for 12 years uh, and I was deciding to leave a job in the US. My wife at that time was working in the UK so I could have gone back and worked there and go back to India with absolutely nothing. And in fact, the chairman of my board um, at that time, I, I, I didn't even have a board, but asked me, have you ever worked in India? And my answer was no, because I had left India after I finished my undergrad uh, um, uh, studies. So I said, no, I've not worked in India. I've worked on India and I've worked on other countries. So he just smiled. So I think, I, I know it's sounding glib, but the point is belief is needed. And I have a Calvin and Hobbes strip on my desk in my office that says, you know, it's from day one. It says, you know, it's, you, you can either have like complete madness and kind of rolling down a, a, a hill, it's acceleration, or you could be a sissy weasel. And, 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 and then he says, you know, there's the world, there's no space in the world for sissy weasels. The, the point is you need that, a little bit of craziness to do that. And I, at CW, we now have multiple startups. With Powering Lively was a $3 million program from our own organization, um, again, being run by somebody. We had an intern who joined us and helped us build out our solar pumps program. Uh, we had uh, uh, someone who was working at Teach for India, similar to Teach for America, who came in and helped us build out these business models for rooftop solar. So that is number one. But that said, two other issues are particularly important. Uh, governance, right? I won't call it a challenge, a CW phase. I think it was an investment in the right thing. If you don't get the governance of your institution right, you will come up with problems eventually. Um, in my first board meeting, I told the first agenda item for the board that I, I presented was what are the conditions under which you, you should fire me? And often the danger we have when we work in civil society or we work on so-called more moral purposes is we assume that we are above the law or because our intention is good, we can, you know, um, we, because we're trying to save the world or we save the planet that we can take shortcuts. No, governance is extremely important. Number three is remaining independent. It is absolutely critical. When, when I set up CW, in our space, there was no institution that was entirely independent of government funding. And that was the objective, that we will work very closely with government, but we will remain independent. So to me, these are both, uh, these three, you know, the, the belief, the, the governance mechanisms, as well as the quest for independence, are both things that are, are the thing, things that you need, but also that present challenges to you because they present ethical quandaries to you every few months. And you've got to take hard calls of what kind of projects will you not do because it might compromise your independence. Who will you not bring your, on, on your board because it might impact the way your governance is structured and so forth. Great. Um, so we have about, I think, 25 questions or so. So I'm going to try to combine okay. them all. Uh, yeah, I keep talking. Sorry. So no, no, no. So, 
find yeah, my best I love your answers. Um, so I'm going to try to combine them a little bit so that, um, Anyway, okay, so the first question, uh, how do you think the rise of popularism and conflict risk will affect climate change globally and attempts towards sustainability? And also, based on what you know about climate in different regions, as well as how certain economies are set up, what do you think would be the most beneficial environmental plan for the U.S. and other regions? Okay, so I think, I think that's both are very important and related questions, and, and I've re very recently written about this. I think we should be very, very concerned about the social dimensions of what climate risk does to us. Um, and in fact, that's what I started out this presentation with as well. We, we might have some understanding of what we are doing to the planet. We might have some scientific understanding of what the planet is doing to us, but we've not really understood what we might do to each other. Five years ago, in the preparation of the um, uh, that climate risk assessment report that I was referring to, we ran a war game in India uh, with officials, diplomats, scientists, generals, admirals from 10 countries, from the US, um, from Germany, from Russia, from India, of course. Um, and we played the and, the, and the war game was actually designed by the Center for Naval Analysis near Washington, DC. And it was a decade by decade war game. Uh, and uh, it wasn't about the countries going to war. It was simply, we are running, you know, all the countries are running their economies, but every decade there's a climate shock. And how do you respond? Within a few decades, it was a century long game, within a few decades, uh, just three or four decades, we ended up in severe conflict-like situations. Now, the reason I say this is that human, settled human civilization since the birth of agriculture, about 10,000 years, has never experienced temperature rise of the kind that we are gonna be facing. So we have no idea. It's ima imagine if your own body, you get a fever and you've got maybe 104 uh, Fahrenheit and you know that's the worst fever you've got. So you don't know what 107 fever is going to look like. You don't know how you will respond. The, I feel that the, the, the resultant uh, populism is going to make it much harder. And that's why, uh, I'm sorry I'm taking a little bit of time, but it's important to understand the piece I wrote around a global risk pooling reserve fund embedded in it is my learnings from my, my, my studies on international relations. We normally focus on what, was, what is called dilemmas of common interests. Can we come together to strike a trade deal, an investment deal, um, buy and sell things from each other? And then we're always in a who's winning, who's losing game. I think we need to switch towards an inner world where we are moving away from multilateralism we need to focus on dilemmas of common aversions. What are the basic things that we all want to avoid? Everyone on the planet wants to avoid a pandemic. Everyone wants to avoid a severe climate event. And framing the question that way changes the game from a game theoretic perspective towards a game of coordination. And it still gives us a chance pool in the right kind of resources to build some resilience against these risks. Now what, similarly in terms of national responses, that's why we've been focusing so much on risk and resilience because at least the national response should be uh, on how to make the infrastructure more resilient against climate risk. The growth side perhaps will rely more on communities and individual action before state-led growth happens. Great. Okay. So changing a little bit, um, another question comes, many leaders and policymakers who are faced with this decision are not environmentally productive enough to consider a de-risking mission that is mm -hmm. as detailed and progressive as yours. What advice would you give them? <laughs> uh, uh, keep it simple. Uh, so I, I, of course, you know, I'm speaking to 
my an, an audience that I believe is more invested in the subject and studies this on a regular basis. Um, but let me let me give you an example, um, and this is where the power of communication also comes in. We released that report that Ari also referred to right at the outset uh, on the economy-wide pathway as jobs growth and sustainability, a new social contract uh, for India's recovery. And we had, we intentionally had a very senior cabinet minister come and release it. Of course, it was a virtual launch. And the cabinet minister is not an expert on climate change, but he is certainly an expert on feeling the pulse of the people. And when he began to translate the message of that report in terms of what it meant, he himself said, you know, jobs growth and sustainability is the pillar of the Indian economy. That's all you need. That's all you need when you, when you have, and when politicians are able to then translate and communicate what technocrats are coming out with, it, it becomes easier to convey. Similarly, the prime minister came out with the slogan, Atmanirbhar Bharat. Atmanirbhar means self-reliant. Self-reliant is not protectionist. It's like, we need to solve our own problems. And suddenly, our messages around jobs, growth, and sustainability, how to build decentralized energy infrastructure, how to build the rural economy, how to grow small enterprises, and so forth, was very much in consonance with self-reliance. So, you know, it, 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 our job still should be to do the detailed analysis. We cannot skip that, right? But then the strategic outreach is a very important part of making change happen. And I've been engaged in some conversations with some people in the US, in Europe, et cetera, what brings about system change? And I'll just give two examples. One, the simpler the action, the more powerful the message. Think about Gandhi's salt march, just walking a few hundred kilometers to the sea to make salt so that the British who were ruling us at that time would not tax us for salt, something as basic as salt. It was a simple action. I will just walk to the sea and make salt myself. Think about Martin Luther King's march. Simple actions that change. And the other factor, I believe, is when there is a convergence of interest of the elite and the vulnerable. The pandemic is an example. None of us has been spared. Each one of us knows someone who has either got the virus or has even lost their lives. We are rich, we are wealthy, the vulnerable are also. Maybe the vulnerable are facing it worse than us, but it's also that convergence of interests of the elite and the vulnerable that can bring about systemic change. Okay, great. So the next question is, how will people in rural communities account for the cost in buying naturally fared food? And with the growing population, will sustainable agriculture be efficient enough to provide for everyone? Also, um, how has pandemic affected the current situation? So uh, on, the, on the pandemic side, actually, what's interesting is, and I was just speaking to the head of our, the government's main think tank, Niti Aayog, just day before yesterday, we had a presentation there. And uh, one of his agricultural advisors was saying that, you know, there is perhaps some change in the cropping pattern because the generally, you know, the two main cropping seasons, the summer and the winter season, you're growing major cereals, which are, which have, you know, uh, chemical fertilizers, pesticides, et cetera. And the pandemic has disrupted some of the supply chains. So the small and marginal farmer who is growing vegetables, fruits, flowers, et cetera, on the small plots of land are perhaps more resilient. But that's a short-term thing. More importantly, is natural farming going to be enough to feed the world? We don't know. We don't know. And that's why crop cutting experiments are needed. Uh, the evaluation we did showed the reduction in chemical inputs and the cost reductions. We have now formed a consortium with Tufts University, with the Woods Hole Research Center in Massachusetts, and CEW and others, 
to start a much larger multi-year analysis of the climate resilience as well as the productivity. Uh, the anecdotal evidence from hundreds of thousands of farmers suggests that productivity has increased in, three, in the last three, four years. But you need much more grounded analysis of crop cutting experience to be able to make that claim strongly. So you mentioned that climate change will cause a lot of disasters, just like the pandemic. Um, one of the questions is, unfortunately, people experience these disasters very differently, unlike the pandemic, which actually hurt every country in a short time in a similar way. So how can we bridge this gap of recognition of climate change internationally? Also, in terms of increasing forewarning preparation before natural disasters, what are the challenges of dispersing this information to rural areas? So there are actually two different questions embedded in there. Um, on the latter part, on the rural areas, or I would even include the vulnerable communities, that's why I gave, showed that a photograph of a coastline city and then a fishing community. And yes, unfortunately, we will still probably go and invest in climate resilient infrastructure for the coastline city rather than for the fishing community. Um, that said, I think early warning systems that we've put in place in India, as I said, have saved tens of thousands of lives now because of, of, of the way it's been done and the storm shelters and so forth. Uh, for rural communities, I think that investment in natural infrastructure, say in semi-arid, semi-arid areas, building check dams, groundwater recharge uh, structures, etc., can significantly increase climate resilience. The slightly different question around countries facing climate disasters differently, what can they do? This was why uh, India proposed last year and the prime minister announced it at the Secretary General Summit, um, the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. And this is already building on other international mechanisms, the one that Japan promoted, the Sendai framework. Um, the point is, what are the common learnings we can have? You know, of course, when you're building a bridge versus building a railway line versus, versus building a levee or, or, along the coast, the infrastructure is very different. If you're a low-lying country like Netherlands or Bangladesh, it's very different from if you were trying to be climate resilient in the Himalayas. Um, but you can actually begin to learn about those modular designs financing mechanisms, et cetera, that are needed. And that's why, I, as, as far as I know, there are about 30 or 35 member countries already in this coalition of disaster resilient infrastructure. And the other element, which is a saying that pooling the different types of risks actually can lower the risk curve. Because if, if you only bring together countries that are going to get faced with coastal storms, then everybody is in the, in the same boat. But if you combine that with an, a landlocked country facing a very different kind of climate risk, you can actually begin to shave some of the risk premiums that insurance agencies might be charging. Great, sorry, I totally forgot about the time. <laughs> but <laughs> did you have to go, right? Yeah, well, maybe another two or three minutes, I can maybe take a couple more questions. Okay, if that is okay, um, there is so many, so I will ask you another one. <laughs> so how do you balance? Well, my responses have also been very long, so I've probably not been able to capture everything that you wanted to ask. No, no, no. You've already covered a lot, but I think there are still some that we would like more of um, if you have some time. So um, the another one is, how do you balance your desire to include financial institutions in the climate conversation with their proc proclivity to prioritize profit over necessary climate action and the well-being of citizens? What methods do you use to communicate effectively with them? And how do you effectively bridge the financial sector and industrial sector to create a greener future? What are the difficulties and how have you overcome them? Okay, so I, I will, uh, this will again be a long answer. Maybe, maybe it will be my last answer, but I will try to respond to it comprehensively. What is the message to give? Um, the message actually came from the former Governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, who a few years ago delivered a speech saying that the tail risks of today will become the normal tomorrow. Uh, when you build a power plant today, 
um, it's going to be around for the next 30, 40 years. Um, you, you might want to refinance it. You might want to sell it off to somebody else. But the closer you get to that end date and the climate risks that are nonlinear keep rising, you're left with potentially stranded assets. This is what is driving a lot of investors, some of the largest investors in the world, to start paying attention to this. Some of it might be greenwashing. A lot of it might be greenwashing, but some of it is general. So that has begun. The more important thing is what can you showcase in terms of other opportunities? And let me give you some real examples. In 2014, as I said, when the Prime Minister's office asked us how big can we get on renewables, we did the analysis in terms of the supply side. And then India hosted the largest renewable energy investment summit. And what's interesting is developers of renewable energy were promising to exceed that target. They were saying we can build 230 gigawatts of renewables. But the potential investors were willing to commit only about $70 uh, billion at that time, which would be about 70 gigawatts. So there was a delta of about three to three and a half uh, between what was needed and what the investors were willing to do. That's when we started looking at, okay, beyond the supply side, what is really holding back investments? And uh, Eri, your, 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 your screen is frozen, but I hope you can still hear me. Um, we started unpacking the, the tariffs and we saw that about 75% of the, of the tariff, of the cost of the tariff was the cost of finance the debt servicing and the return on equity. So we started looking at how can you reduce that cost of finance, which means that with the same smaller pool of capital, you can actually invest in more capacity. And we saw that double back state guarantees, insurance mechanisms, the kind that I presented, multi-country insurance mechanisms, et cetera, can actually drive uh, can down the cost of finance. So as a result, the cost of solar in India has gone from about 30 US cents to less than two and a half US cents now in the last decade. Which brings me to the third part of this answer. And I go back to nearly a decade ago. Um, what do you do to actually convince an investor on the ground? And I think the most important thing is to show opportunity on the ground. I'm going to give you an example from rural India. Uh, I was going around rural India in 2011 or 12, uh, looking at distributed energy systems. And I came across a land, landless laborer who had a small plot of land in a forest where his thatched home was. Um, he was a widower. He, has two, he had three daughters. One was working as a nurse in Bangalore and two others were living with him. One was in school, one was going to a nearby community college. And, uh, but they were desperately poor. Uh, they were growing their own vegetables in the plot of land behind their, the, behind their hut. Um, they had a bamboo, a sliced bamboo at the top of the roof to collect rainwater. But he had a solar panel. At that time, that tiny solar panel, about that size, cost $400, just a single solar panel. And I asked him, why did you take on a loan of $400 to install a, 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 a solar panel when you're so desperately poor? And he said, you know, before this, I was uh, using kerosene for lighting. And, uh, and he had two white shirts. One he was wearing, one was on, his, on the clothesline. He said, my white shirt would get dirty. And I was spending, at that time, he said, 50 rupees. That time, that was $1 a month on detergent powder. Okay. So I'm talking about literally household level economics. He said, after solar, my shirts don't get as dirty. So I'm using, I'm spending 20 rupees a month on detergent powder. And I give that example because I can guarantee that no Wall Street banker would have ever come up with a renewable energy financing 
mechanism based on savings of household costs on deter detergent powder. But unless we get that granular, whether it's for a landless laborer, whether it's for a poor person in a, in a poor locality, in an urban setting, whether it's for a small and marginal farmer or whether it's for a billionaire renewables investor, and we work for all of them. If you don't get granular, you don't get the investor in, interested. But when you do get granular, you open up investment opportunities that range from the hundreds of dollars to the billions of dollars. Great, thank you so much. And I'm so sorry for the technical difficulties I seem to be having. I've been going off and on. I'm, I'm so sorry about that. Um, can we ask you another question or shall we stop? Maybe one last, okay. <laughs> okay, the one last one. Um, so I've also been wondering, there's a question, if you could briefly explain how you got the idea for CEEW and the process you went through to create and establish it as a top policy research institution. The idea was a little serendipitous. Um, again, when, while I was at Princeton uh, as a postdoctoral fellow, uh, I was spending one winter in India and I was actually a visiting fellow at one of the think tanks here. And I, I was at that time con contemplating coming back to the country, contributing in some way or the other. But I didn't know exactly how. I'd worked in universities, I'd worked in international organizations, uh, but I was trying to think what, what could I be potentially doing in India. This was just a few weeks after the Copenhagen Climate Summit. I, I had gone there. Um, I had stood for eight and a half hours in minus eight degrees trying to get in. There's chaos. And of course, it was a failed summit. And it struck me then that something was wrong in the way we were approaching the problem of climate change, that these top down negotiations were not working, bottom up investment was not coming. Something else had to happen. And I was looking for a home to try and experiment with some of these ideas. And I couldn't find such a home. I started talking to several people, I talked to policymakers, politicians, um, and I talked to some industrialists. And I ended up talking to um, uh, someone who then became the founding trustee of CEW, um, Mr. Tarun Das. And we got chatting. And as he was mentioning on our anniversary event just a couple of weeks ago, he said, we started dreaming together. And I said, why don't we create something new altogether? And I spoke to another senior politician who is now the Prime Minister Sherpa for the G20. He's held several cabinet positions. He was a member of parliament uh, for many years. And I spoke to him as well. And he said, look, we need to integrate these issues of energy, environment, and water. And I spoke to uh, one of the country's leading industrialists, who's now our chairperson, Mr. Chamshit Godridge. And uh, and he's been one of the champions of sustainability. So I had the advantage of these luminaries in, in industry, in industry associations, in politics, and in governan governance, who were all cl clear that something had to change and something India had to get onto a different track. But they gave me homework. I said, go write a concept note. So I came back to Princeton in February 2010. I wrote that concept note. And I sent it back to them. And I got... Um, a, a three word or a two word email response, you're good. <laughs> so, so that was uh, some, some, some uh, you know, gave me some belief that I was referring to earlier. And then the next few months, I plotted more carefully about what the strategic plan would be, what would I need, there was no money. Uh, and then I did that leap of faith, came back, um, and uh, for the first few months, use my salary, so use my savings to pay my salary. We didn't, we hadn't even registered the entity. We didn't have a bank account. On day one, I built a desk uh, uh, in a in a room that had been lent to me by the Confederation of Indian Industry. Um, but what was very clear to me from the start, and I referred to it, so number one, we need a very different kind of team, and we need to be output oriented right from the start. 
think tanks generally, and you look across the world, even in the US, tend to be very top heavy. You have people who have served in government, very senior cabinet people, then having a sinecure in a think tank before their next term in government. And you get star power. But then you have, you know, a lot of faceless interns and consultants doing the real hard work. I wanted to, I was determined to invert that. I was like, we need to invert that model. So we're going to recruit young and we're going to keep producing outputs. Our first research report came out within six, uh, six and a half weeks of establishing the Maharashtra Guangdong, uh, and that was on the design of the what became the Green Climate Fund. The Maharashtra Guangdong Partnership on Sustainability, two biggest provinces in India and China, we authored first time an NGO is authoring an intergovernmental partnership. We got that signed within two and a half months of establishing. Uh, we facilitated the India-US Joint Clean Energy R&D Centers, a $100 million initiative, which then grew $125 million within the first one and a half years of our establishment. Uh, so we, were, we had to keep producing the output and making sure that it met international standards of peer review. Um, because that is the other danger that you, you know, in the urgency of trying to get a policy brief out, you downplay the, the, the research rigor. And that very quickly began to attract a lot of the, 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 the what I would call Astapa, our young team. And there are, I, I now joke with my senior colleagues, even in my, 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 with my younger colleagues, that if I apply to CW today for a job, I'd probably not get recruited. With the, the kind of skills that they are developing and deploying, but that's really what keeps us cutting edge and a really exciting place to work. Yeah, I think that's the best message. Um, and then like focusing on the youth is what we are trying to do here on Emory Climate Talks as well. Um, there's so much voice that we can hear from the youth. So I'm so glad that you're bringing the very important um, voice um, in India and then all over the countries. And there, there were some students in my class that wanted to have like an international um, activist coming from various countries having a panel together. So maybe we can collaborate on that um, to have more youth voices coming to uh, coming together in the sure. difficult times. Sure. Just one last thing I wanted to say is that the other thing we've tried to keep pay attention to is the role of building careers in public policy. Um, often you see people coming through think tanks just for short periods and then leaving because you know the private sector is offering a better pay, et cetera. And we focused on, on that longevity of career building a lot, particularly for women. Um, we, three years ago, we launched a program called Women in Sustainability. And it's entirely dedicated to making sure early and mid-career women are able to stay the course to build their careers in public policy. And again, we, would, we, would, there, there is, we are now members of larger sort of such networks across the world. So would love to engage in more conversations and have my colleagues engage in conversations with um, students at Emory and elsewhere to try and build these networks of support. Um, because I, I am convinced that the, the, the most interesting work and, 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 and our brains are our brightest at this stage of our careers. We just need the enabling environment to make that happen. Yeah, I cannot agree more. So, well, thank you so much. Um, it was so lovely to um, have you here and thank you so much. Uh, sorry that we went over time and thank you so much everybody for a great discussion. I'm so sorry that I couldn't get to all the questions uh, but we have to let Dr. Gosh go because he's so busy. He has another meeting. Uh, so thank you again. We are going to be having a movie screening at the end of September, and we will be uh, sharing more information over the newsletter. So stay safe and healthy, everybody. Thank you again, Arunaba, for a great talk and a discussion. And we hope to see you very soon. Thank you, Eri. And it's been great to connect with you. Uh and see you after so long, but I really hope that we can have you back in India and do some presentations here. And yeah, I would love to. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.